curious to know who the audience is. If it's mostly community folks or if it's Okay, I'm going to get started so we, we don't run over the amount of time that we're allotted. Um, my name is Joan Sigler. I'm the Growth Program Lead for the Office of Economic Adjustment. And our office works with communities that are affected by DOD actions and decisions, such as base closure and realignment. Um, we work with communities when there's been a major cutback in defense industries. And then also we work with communities, as many of you have been hearing at sessions today, on compatible use joint land use studies. Um, since the audiences that we normally deal with are more those involved with, with BRAC actions, I'm very familiar with most of the audience that we deal with, but I know in this particular session I see a lot of faces that I'm not familiar with. Um, is there anyone here who is, does not know OEA or is not familiar with OEA at all? Okay, good. Um, what I wanted to do and what the purpose of this particular session is, is even though the, the focus of the conference has been on looking at partnership and sustainment of military mission, um, almost more from a land use and environmental perspective, one of the other areas that we felt was important to, to highlight and bring attention to is that another major way that communities and installations work together in partnership and another way of sustaining the mission is in the role that communities have in providing support to the installations and to the warfighters and their families, which has really been um, exemplified by the significant growth actions that have been taking place in the last five or six years. Um, as a result of BRAC 2005, um, Global Defense Posture Realignment, Grow the Army, Grow the Force for the Marines, and um, Army Modularity, many installations have been receiving significant numbers of personnel increases. And the, the days of the fence um, between the installation and community, um, basically blocking the two places as two completely separate entities is, is long gone for most of our installations. And the, the military bases rely heavily upon the communities for support in housing, education, roads, mental health, um, social services, emergency response, and so on. So in this particular session, we're going to be highlighting three of the growth communities that um, have been working with their installation over the past couple years to help sustain the mission and accommodating the growth actions that have been taking place over the last several years. Um, the three installations, as you can tell from the agenda that we'll be talking about today, are going to be Joint Base Lewis McCord, Fort Carson, and then um, Joint Base San Antonio in Texas. Um, our first presenter today is going to be Dave Buer from the city of Lakewood in the state of Washington. And Joint Base Lewis McCord Growth Coordination Plan was one of the first processes and products that they developed through their, their process to help identify what the requirement's going to be as a result of the growth and to see what the community needed to do to support that growth. Um, the stakeholder participation in that planning process for Joint Base Lewis McCord involved over 100 different public and private sector service providers and jurisdictions within the region. Their plan was adopted in December 2010, and a memorandum of agreement is now in place, which helps provide a framework for the ongoing collaboration with the local governments, the military installation, and the state and federal agencies. And the plan right now is in its early stages of implementation. To talk about the plan, we have Dave Buer here, who is the Assistant City Manager and Community Development Director with the City of Lakewood, Washington. <clears throat> Dave has over 30 years of experience in municipal government, both in California and in the state of Washington, and a background in land use planning, affordable housing, social services, redevelopment, and military base impacts. And Dave is a graduate of Brigham Young University. So please welcome our first presentation panelist and presenter, Dave Buer. Uh, thank you, Joan. The first thing I will say is my biggest challenge has been trying to acclimate to the weather here in Nashville. <laughs> I am not used to this. This is hot for me. 
And you have to keep in mind that summer in Seattle is equated to the number of days or hours over 80 degrees. And at the last check, there have been 78 hours of summer in Seattle and Tacoma. So it's a big difference in between here. Uh, my presentation is really about three parts. Uh, where we are at currently with uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord, I will say JBLM. Where we were before the growth management plan and its adoption, and where we're headed with the growth management plan. And with that, I will go ahead and press the first button. Uh, just some context here. Uh, you can see uh, Joint Base Lewis McCord is in green, and you have Tacoma, Lakewood, University Place to the north. And then further to the south, you have uh, Olympia. The county within uh, which JBLM is situated has about 800,000 people. Uh, the population adjoining JBLM is probably on the vicinity between 500 and 600,000. This is a very urban area, a base which was established in 1917 by a gift of land from Pierce County to the military. JBLM is bisected by I-5, and it's the size of the city of Seattle, approximately at 86,000 acres. Um, there's been a number of things that have happened in Washington relative to land use, and I get a, a very quick uh, overview. Uh, in 1990, the state legislature was fairly upset with the local government over the sprawl that was occurring, so they adopted the Growth Management Act. In, in that year. That ca later came into play with new land use regulations in Pierce County and also with the city of Lakewood. 1992, uh, Pierce County uh, did perform a joint land use study. The Pierce County Council at that time was reluctant to adopt it, and so they accepted the report but did not take any action. But because of the Growth Management Act, later they were compelled to do so, so they went ahead and adopted new zoning regulations and included in, uh, elements of the, the J. Luce report into those regulations. And then along comes the city of Lakewood, which incorporates in 1996. And so the city of Lakewood got the responsibility for implementing those new regulations, which at the time we did not know exactly what all that meant. In 98, we had uh, an ACU study performed on the C-17. And then also at that time, because there was quite a bit of uh, um, debate in the community over what uh, ACUs would have uh, or impacts upon the area of, of Lakewood, there was a special study commission that compared uh, military and civilian airport-related re uh, land use regulations. By 2000 uh, and 2001, the city adopted its own comprehensive plan and new revised land use regulations. And then 2008, we did something called the Burke Report. And that was an effort, an attempt to acquire clear zone properties. Uh, we have about $60 million worth of property in the clear zone with industrial development on it. The Burke Report did the analysis to find ways of which acquiring that property. And later, Pierce County Council stepped up and has taken an effort to begin purchase of those lands. Lakewood, before uh, the uh, uh, growth coordination plan, uh, does have a, a fairly significant level of uh, air corridor enforcement strategies. Uh, approximately 8% of the city's housing stock uh, is located in the air corridor. We have about 22,500 housing units a population of 60,000, and so we had a fairly significant number of houses that are located within that um, uh, APZ1 and APZ2. Uh, since incorporation, we have gone about the process of closing a mobile home park, which was a non-conforming use, working with the local school district to close Oakwood Elementary School, which was located in the APZ2 zone. And we have also been busy using various state funds to acquire undeveloped lands and turning those into open space parks also within the APZ uh, locations. What's unique in Lakewood in our particular situation is uh, we do take the uh, regulations pertaining to density within the air corridor fairly seriously. So for commercial businesses, when you come in and you apply for any types of building permits or business license or anything of that ilk, you are required to determine to us the number of employees that you will have in your facility. If you meet the density requirements of our regulations, you're allowed to proceed. If you do not, you are not allowed to open your business in those locations. You are directed to locate in other locations, uh, but we are trying to apply, uh, comply with the regulations of our 
air corridor zones. We do take pro proactive enforcement through civil and criminal actions and public nuisance abatement. At any point in time, we have between 30 to 35 public nuisances, dangerous building abatements underway. Uh, our code enforcement program has it, uh, three code officers, their own attorney, a uh, fairly extensive uh, uh, a budget, and, and we have been very successful in, in, in getting people to take us seriously on some of these issues. Uh, pertaining to enforcement. Uh, also, I did already mention the acquisition of some industrial zone property by Pierce County located in the clear zone. The recent growth at JBLM uh, between 2003 and 2010, we've seen an increase in population, uh, both military and civilian, from 35,000 to almost 51,000. Of that total, 48, uh, 45,000 is military, 4,500 is civilian. And then you see associated impact with the number of family members going up to 53,000. Um, all this was fairly doable until the fall of 2010 when 18,000 plus troops came back from Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. And then all of a sudden we saw the impact that had upon our, our, our interstate system. There is additional growth anticipated at JBLM uh, with um, Additional uh, personnel being established as part of an aviation uh, brigade. Uh, you're seeing a total uh, Army personnel going up to 52,000. By 2016, uh, JBLM will support a total of 136,000 soldiers, airmen, and dependents, in addition to retiree population of about 118,000 within the region. Total population accessing JBLM on a regular basis is about a quarter of a million. To give you an idea, between 125,000 and 150,000 cars go through Joint Base lewis mccord gates every day. There's roughly 900,000 uh, visits, outpatient visits to Madigan Hospital, and roughly about 140,000 emergency visits at that same facility. So it's a very busy place. Uh, regional and economic impact. Um, this is news to most people in the state of Washington. Uh, Boeing is your largest employer, followed by the state, followed by Joint Base Lewis-McChord, followed by the Navy, and then Microsoft. Microsoft. If you combine the total impacts of JBLM and the Navy, it is the largest employer in the state of Washington. By far, JBLM is the largest employer in Pierce County. Uh, construction spending. Uh, total construction at JBLM in the last five years is approximately 1.8 billion. Uh, you're going to see continued construction from 2006 to 2015 for a total of $3.9 billion on the base. Uh, approximately about two billion of that will be spent over the next four years. Um, one of the things that's going on right now is the construction of additional facilities at Madigan Hospital, uh, which res has resulted in less and less parking on the facility. Uh, future demand is about 800 new soldiers. Uh, we have tried to do some work in determining where they would live, so you see some percentages going to Lacey, Lakewood, and Tacoma, and then also DuPont, which is adjacent to JBLM. Well, we've done a fairly sophisticated traffic modeling to determine where people are going because of the impacts upon the I-5 corridor. Uh, most people do use the I-5 corridor to get around to other parts within Pierce County. 30% go to Thurston County, and that's mainly because there's more housing available to fit soldiers' needs in Thurston County than in Pierce County. 20% go to the east, which is Parkland, Spanaway, an unincorporated part of Pierce County and Puyallup. And then uh, a certain portions then go to Tacoma and Lakewood. Uh, Lakewood gets approximately 15%, um, and Tacoma gets another 15%. Uh, th this is a good picture of the entrance to JBLM during most days. As you can see, it's pretty crowded. Uh, we do have some unique access challenges at JBLM. Uh, there are unique work uh, schedules and habits. Uh, deployments uh, often impact uh, the flow of traffic of people onto the base. Security, and I'll get into that in a minute because you have some unique situations occurring. There is currently no priority for public transportation. Fixed bus routes are unable, to, are unable to only serve the installation. 
lack of parking in JBLM. Uh, there is a dated infrastructure on the base. The need for additional uh, 20 inbound lanes to the existing 34 inbound lanes. And the in unfunded cost of roads within the installation itself is about $91 million. And then because of all this growth, uh, we did go through the process of doing a uh, growth management plan. Uh, as Joan mentioned, it was completed in December, and we're now in the process of implementation. Uh, this gives you a sort of a list of all those who were involved, two counties, seven municipalities, and seven school districts, et cetera. And this is kind of a chamber of commerce piece here that shows you all the different types of uh, groups that were involved in this entire process. Uh, fundamental recommendations. Uh, we need to, number one, find better ways of communicating with each other and improving access to information. And then we came up with some targeted recommendations uh, to improve access to the existing services, and this requires a great deal of co uh, coordination with the Department of Transportation. Promote JBLM as a center of regional economic significance, improve support for military families, and improve regional mobility. And this just gives you an example of what needs to be done. We did, again, some very sophisticated uh, traffic modeling, but basically all the major intersections into, J into JBLM need to be rebuilt, as well as new, new added lanes installed onto uh, I-5. Uh, this gives you an idea of the cost. Uh, each one of these intersections costs between 22 and $72 million, uh, the more, more urban ones. The Thorn Lane interchange is at 300 million, and then to do the I-5 mainline improvements is 600 million. Total costs are about 1.3 billion dollars to improve I-5, basically from Tacoma uh, down to Thurston County. And let me also add, this is not just the, a problem. Uh, some people think this is all JBLM's fault. It's not. Uh, that area of Pierce County and King County in the Puget Sound region has grown significantly in the last 30 years, and the state has made no improvements whatsoever to this section of the intersection, or this section of the freeway. And so now all of a sudden you're seeing the result of having not pre-planned or did any type of coordination. All of a sudden you're hit with this very large bill, and it is something that we're all trying to deal with. Our next steps, one of the things that we are wanting to do is to gauge uh, housing preferences uh, by residential soldiers. Uh, we would like to do a need survey. Uh, that is something that's on our docket uh, for the next uh, period. And we'll be looking at uh, uh, who's living where, rank, marital status, number of dependents, age of children, as schools attending uh, by students. Because frankly, Nobody really knows where the off-post off soldiers and their families are living. We have general ideas, but 70% 70, 70 of the soldiers and their families don't live on post, and we'd like to have a better idea how that impacts local so, uh, so, social services and other things. As kind of a fun thing, we knew that we had uh, some of the things that came up in our growth management plan was a need to, to get greater uh, contractors exposed to uh, military contractors uh, processes and how to get military contractors. So we did a contractor's workshop. And we grossly underestimated the level of interest. This is a photograph of our city council chambers. We had uh, 232 in attendance. We really needed, we had to turn back a considerable number of, of other people who wanted to attend but couldn't. We did have guest speakers come in and they, uh, there's the list of the topics that uh, we, we discussed. One of the more interesting ones was learning from the School of Hard Knocks about military contracting. But we also uh, provided hands-on computer workshops to get businesses registered. Uh, we put this program together at about $19,000 to support our local business community, and the demand was overwhelming, and what we found out, there's a, a much higher need for more workshops. Areas of mutual interest and emerging issues. Uh, we did receive an award of $4.8 million from the Department of Labor to help displace military spouses and civilian defense workers find employment in, Th Pierce in Thurston counties. Uh, one of the interesting things is marine operations on American Lake, and I don't know if you can see this very well, but half the lake is in the city of Lakewood and the other half of the lake is on JBLM. And so you can launch your boat on Lakewood property, you can la launch your boat on uh, Camp Murray property, you can launch your boat on uh, JBLM property, but when you get into issues of security, 
uh, once you get past that big island, it's, it's really kind of up for grabs as to who's doing what, when, and where. So it, it poses something of an interesting forest protection question that we're going to be working with uh, Fort Lewis on in the future. One of the things that's very iconic in the Pacific Northwest, but it's a pain in the neck for me, is seaplanes. Seaplanes do land on, on, this, on this lake, and they're supposed to land on that line. They don't land on that line. They land wherever they want to land, depending upon the weather conditions and the locations of other boats. Mm -hmm. But part of the problem is that lake is within a basin, and so when they take off, you have two military uh, flight lines nearby with Grayfield and McCord Field, they may not know that you're coming up. And so you have a low-flying plane that is accessing the, uh, the, uh, the space in the vicinity of the bases, and that's something that we would like to address a little bit more. Uh, National Guard Camp Marie main gate relocation. Uh, the Ma National Guard facility is adjacent to JBLM. Uh, because of the traffic issues, we're looking at relocating the gate, and as a result, we're running into some conflicts with neighborhoods. And we're trying to resolve that with uh, an intensive program of, uh, of uh, congestion management. I've already mentioned the Camp Murray uh, boat launch a little bit. Uh, I've already talked about uh, transportation. There's a Shoreline Management Act update required in the state of Washington. It affects all three en entities, the city, Camp Murray, and, and uh, JBLM. At this point in time, we're not quite sure how to address federal issues in relationship to that Shoreline update. Uh, we've already mentioned the memorandum of agreement that was signed by a variety of other agencies in the area. And what I really wanted to get to is the creation of this new thing called the South Sound Military Communities Partnership. And this is how it works. Uh, you have uh, members of the partnership, which are basically uh, the agencies and groups. Uh, usually these are going to be your legislators. Excuse me. You have members of the partnership, which can be any public agency. Then you have an elected officials council. And then you have the steering committee, which is made up of primarily senior management staff and subcommittees. This, this is a different model than, than other communities are using. I will be very clear on that. The steering committee is basically doing a, a good share of the day-to-day -day work in resolving issues. And this is really the key part here, is to foster effective communication, understanding, and mutual support by serving as a primary point of coordination. What is the best thing about this new, cre this new creature is that when local communities have an issue, they all can get together and speak directly with the, uh, the chief of staff on JBLM to solve things. And that goes a long way in resolving lots and lots of conflicts, where before the chief of staff was having to meet with a variety of different agencies, now he can re meet around one round table and discuss issues as a group and seeing if we can't resolve them together. This, uh, uh, to us, is a very unique aspect to this plan, and we think it, it, it will bring success in the future. And I think I'm almost out of time, and so I'll turn my mic over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, one, uh, unless anyone has any really burning question, I'd like to hold all the questions until after all three of the panelists have had an opportunity to provide their information. Um, what, when we were talking among ourselves earlier and, and preparing for this session, um, there were four things that we talked about as far as each of them touching upon and things that you may want to keep in mind as far as your questions following the session. And that was one, one of them is, how did the community organize itself? to be able to both to respond to the growth and to work with the installation when you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions um, surrounding a military installation. Secondly was um, how, how do they determine what the impacts of the growth were going to be. Thirdly is looking at how and how did they interact with the installation. And then fourthly, once they determined what the impacts, what is the community doing right now in response to those impacts. So if you kind of keep those four themes in mind as, as they're talking and um, uh, glean what they've done in each of their cases uh, on those four issues. Um, our second presenter is Kate Hatton from the Pikes Peak Council of Governments, and their organization has been working um, on issues related to the growth at Fort Carson. One of the things that they decided early on was how important it was to have good, accurate information and to be able to disseminate that information to the affected jurisdictions within their area. So um, that's one of the things that Kate's going to be talking about is how they develop this information and uh, have been able to disseminate it to the interested parties. Um, Kate, whoops, glasses back on. 
Um, Kate's the Military Impact Planning Program Manager for the Pikes Peak Council of Governments, and she served in local government and community positions for more than 20 years, including International City County Management Association, Douglas County, Colorado, and the City of Los Angeles. Um, Kate has a Master's of Public Administration from Syracuse University and a Bachelor of Arts from Occidental College. Um, please join me in welcoming Kate Hatton. Give me a second here to pull this up. We will death by PowerPoint you this afternoon after lunch. Find the slides here, please. F5. F5. There we go. Hi, I'm going to talk about uh, the next step after you do the growth coordination plan. Dave talked about that. Uh, Fort Carson and the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments did that as well, too. And why did it fall onto PPA CG? I do everything with acronyms. So you all work with acronyms. We do, too, in the local government side of the equation. So. Slow me down if, if, you, if, you, if I speak out of one you haven't heard yet. But the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, or PPACG, is the regional planning agency in the Fort Carson region. We have other military installations too, but they're Air Force, and we'll talk about those some other time. No offense, really. The, uh, so we do a lot of regional transportation, regional air quality, water quality planning. And so as that regional entity, we were well positioned to be able to, what I call herd the cats, really get all the local governments. We have 16 member local governments, but also work with the military community, the business community. And so we took on the growth plan activities, and we're in the Im definitely in the implementation phase of that at this point. We have done a lot to uh, quantify the impacts. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. And really serve as the information clearinghouse, being that conduit of information between Fort Carson and the surrounding com communities in terms of what the simple questions, what we thought were simple at first, how many soldiers do you have on post right now? It, it was asked in 2006. And it took a while to get that answer. And you know, 20 people were asking that question of the installation. And then once we could coordinate a little better and have one person ask and find the right point of contact, that was pretty helpful. Um, one of the key things, too, was managing expectations as the business community, the, the, the housing industry, were very excited about the thought of 10 plus thousand soldiers and their families coming because they thought they would sell a lot of houses next week. And really, what was the timing of that growth? What was when it was it coming? And so at the same time that the housing community was very excited, the school districts kind of looked like deer in headlights in terms of what they thought their school numbers were going to be. So working with a lot of different entities besides just the local governments, the school districts, again, the housing community, uh, the, off po the, the Department of Human Services that provided so social welfare issues, the behavioral health providers who were providing services off post. All these folks tried to figure out what, what was going on and what was it going to mean to them as we went through and, and when things would happen and how things would happen. So, And this is generally the area that we're looking at. This is Fort Carson here. And there are other military installations around here as well, the Air Force Academy, Peterson and Trever Air Force bases. This pink area is the what we call kind of the main area where 98% or so, 96% or so of those who live off the installation live in this region out around here. Again, mostly in El Paso County in the Colorado Springs area, but some folks go do, do down into Pueblo County. And then this is Fremont County on this side. And they have not seen a whole lot of impacts yet, but might still based on where different gates might be opening as, as Fort Carson grows and their units move farther south on the installation. So how do we kind of go about managing these expectations? Again, talking a lot about, and you'll hear a common theme amongst the community folks, is getting timely, accurate information. Who's there? How many kids do they have? How many families do they come? Where are they, co where are they gonna live? When are they coming? Trying to figure out all those pieces. So we tried to figure that out through a v variety of methods. We tried to get um, Army Stationing in Installation Plan, ASIP numbers. We tried to, to sur survey soldiers and families in terms of what their housing preferences were. Do you want to live on the installation? Do you want to live in apartments? Do you want multifamily housing? Do you want to live in a single family residence? And where, you know, how many cars you have? Are you going to be driving long distances? And then finding out where our housing stock was. Of course, all this happened within the dynamic of the housing market situation and the recession that took place, which changed a lot of things that we expected to happen. But what we did was really try to take a look at what the numbers were and, again, get a sense of Fort Carson is an area that deploys a lot. Five to 10,000 soldiers are, are, are not there at any given time because they're fighting wars overseas. So this is what we came up with with a demographic model. And this is the very basic piece of it. 
And this is, again, trying to manage those expectations. These are the numbers that people expected to see right away you know, from going from 14, 13, 15,000 soldiers to 25,000 soldiers. Clearly, it didn't happen overnight. And this is what people expected. But this is actually what people got. Because these are the people who are actually fit the, the soldiers physically present in the region as the deployments continue. So I kind of refer to this as the sine curve, if you will. But it's showing steady growth, but again, significant gaps in the number of soldiers and family members who were there. We also tried to drill that down into family members. The other piece of data we were able to obtain were, were DEER's data, De Defense Eligibil Eligibility Enrollment Reporting System that would give us much more detailed information, not, not speculation about what is the average number of, of, of s percentage of soldiers who were married, what are the average, having 2.5 children or whatever. This gave us more detailed information based on the units at Fort Carson, how many spouses are there, how many children do they have, what are the ages of those children, and where are they living? Are they living in the region? One of the factors that we surveyed was, are there, or will you stay in the region? Do you stay in the region when your spouse deploys? And the first time around, that number was about 80%. So which meant that 20% of families did not stay in the region. So they took up their family and they moved, they moved back in with mom or somewhere else where they had family supports. And again, that depended on whether a spouse had a job in the region, whether their kids were established in school and those sorts of things. But having that information helped us get some more detail. Again, we're showing that these are spouses and these are children. Those numbers are a little more stable. They don't spike quite as much. But there is some certain difference in expectations in terms of the numbers of of soldiers and families living in the region. How do we use that information? That information directly leads into what we expect the housing demand to be. In fact, the apartment communities have told us that they can now plan because they have that information. Their vacancy rates very much mirror what the deployment cycles look like. And so that's been very helpful to them to be able to better plan. The challenge being that, again, as we've talked with, with what Fort Carson calls the full nest scenario, when all the soldiers are back, it, will there be enough multifamily housing? That's a challenge that we're looking as we go forward. But also, again, as, as Dave talked about, the impacts on the transportation system. Again, because PPACG is a regional transportation planning agency, the organization and, and the region was able to get ahead of, I think, the transportation curve and rearrange priorities and put funding toward gates and interstate changes and roadway, roadway networks. And we had some local funding through a rural transportation authority, a sales tax funded project that was able to do a significant amounts of transportation improvements right near the installation. Uh, again, schools, where folks live depend, there are, there are many 20 some odd school districts that potentially Fort Carson families could be attending, uh, really six or eight heavily impacted ones. And so where, where folks are living depend, would impact what schools they were going to. And again, what, or is that high school, elementary school? And generally, it's the child care preschool ages and elementary school ages that are the uh, most heavily impacted in the region. And then behavioral health service, it was mentioned, I think Joan mentioned the fact that, or somebody did at some point, maybe it was at lunch. Heavily deployed communities, they, the family's under a lot of stress. Just moving is a lot. There are a lot of challenges with... Uh, the cycles, the deployment cycles, and what the effects are on families. And so there are a lot of impacts to behavioral health providers, social service providers, uh, domestic violence issues, and other things, child neglect that we have, we're working on. So what, what, I, what we call this is on this other side, you've ta heard of soldier readiness and family readiness. What we're talking about this in terms of community readiness. The point being that communities being able to support what the installation needs off post helps soldiers do their, do their jobs. So. What we've continued to do is work on those partnerships, again, be that conduit. Fort Carson, we've had partnership groups on each of the different issue areas, housing, transportation, and we have Fort Carson representatives who participate in all those partnership groups and work with us on the steering committee. And we have direct contacts so that we can make sure we get as much information as possible to be able to share that information, again, in whether it's that sign curve of deployment cycles or whether it's what we're expecting, when we're expecting growth and those sorts of things. This is a quick example. That was going into gate 20 uh, during the construction and that was clearly not a peak travel time. But again, these are some of the projects that we've done on the transportation side, again, working to have make sure that the infrastructure is available. And this is, I always have at least one slide, and I probably have more than one that nobody can read, and this is probably one of it. I think the slides will be available at some point. But these show the different school districts in the region. 
And again, each of these districts, that growth that happened in 2009, six of the districts showed double digit growth in the number of Fort Carson students. So that was a big change. Usually it was one school district, the district date down here that was the main impact of Fort Carson soldiers and families. They have on post schools and off post schools and about 68% or 60 of their student body are Fort Carson students. But other, install, other school districts started seeing a lot of school growth as well too from Fort Carson. One of the challenges is the special needs. The exceptional family member program and what we, this, the word on the street is that Fort Carson is a great place to go if you've got a child with special needs, particularly autism spectrum disorders. So that the, our, one, of the, one of the big districts, that one with 60% Fort Carson students, they have basically triple the autism rate of the, of the national average because so many folks are coming there. That adds extra challenges. That also adds extra challenges to military families. It's very stressful enough to have a child with autism when you add in a, a spouse who isn't there for a year at a time and doing that four and five times, that gets to be very challenging. Uh, another way we've tried to look at the things in terms of getting information out to the school districts and helping coordinate and share information about special needs or the numbers of kids and what ages of those kids and where they'll be living is, you know, here's another map you can't read. Um, you can go to our website and see all these in great detail. We've also looked at mapping child care facilities off post. It's clear that Fort Carson on post will not be able to, to meet all of the demand for child care needs for Fort Carson families. And also, again, 75% of those families live in the community and you know more than 20 minutes away in some cases. So we have mapped by zip code all of the off-post childcare centers, homes, Head Start programs, preschool programs, after school programs. In addition to that, we've mapped where what take military subsidies, whether it's Army child care in your neighborhood, military child care in your neighborhood, uh, the after school based programs, whether they are accredited. As DOD has done a really good job of making sure that on post child development centers have really high quality standards. And that's not necessarily always the case off post. And so this gives soldiers and families information. It also gives the early childhood councils and the child care providers in the region good information for planning and showing where there are gaps. Well, here's an area where there are a lot of Fort Carson soldiers and a lot of family members and so many thousand children living by in this zip code and there are only three child care centers and only one of them takes military subsidies. So that's the good information that we're taking and moving forward and working with those child care providers to find more detailed information. Um, again, behavioral health and social services are a very big challenge in communities with have high de deployment rates. And so we've done a lot of things partnering with Fort Carson. Fort Carson has an award-winning Army 101 program where they bring in off-post providers and give them very basic information about Army culture, uh, PTSD, TBI, and what the, the needs of soldiers are, what the, the, the deployment cycles are, and how that affects families. We've taken that a step to what we call Army 201, or community provider trainings, to give more detailed information on the, the R for Gen cycle, the deployment cycles, the um, resiliency issues, what's going on. We've even brought in housing again apartment managers to say this is what you're seeing and getting them to ask questions about you know wh who, what a battle buddy is or how do you can contact with a first sergeant so that they can get information and, and help soldiers directly again they want to help the soldiers not get them in trouble but if there's an issue they want to be able to make sure they get resolved we also and a lot of with the help of, of OEA working on a network of care and military system of care some communities Colorado um, our region has Maryland and California and I think a county in Texas and Oregon or at least in those three states, have, have statewide networks of care by county. This is a web-based resource that provides a great deal of information and assistance on services that are available to soldiers and family members. It also gives information on a whole range of, of the types of pills that somebody may be taking, how to get to the VA or your veteran service officer. And it's a way to help our region in particular that has been very fragmented and hasn't done a really good job of care coordination, trying to do a better job of making sure that everybody, not just soldiers and family members, but also the uh, other providers know what's available and can connect people as quickly as possible to resources, kind of through a no wrong door approach. Military system of care, again, trying to figure out a way that off-post providers can better align with Fort Carson in terms of available services. Does off-post need more inpatient facilities? Fort Carson is looking at, at providing 15 beds of inpatient psychiatric care. So where do the needs go in the community? Not Again, trying to coordinate also the, 
the referral systems and the care coordination and case management pieces. So those are some of the things that we're strategically planning on right now to try and do a better job of coordinating and making sure that we, we have the right resources where they need to be at the right levels. Resources are not always a challenge as well, uh, as we've talked about in terms of uh, people trying to do more with less, both in, within DOD and, and in communities. Uh, sustainability is another big issue in our region. Fort Carson has very aggressive sustainability goals. They've been designated as net zero and uh, for all three, w energy, waste, and water. So they have a lot of work to do to figure out how they're going to do that. They need community support if they want to get service members to the installation without, with, through something other than single occupant vehicles, they're going to need off-post help for transit and other services, for example. So uh, we are trying to make sure, we are working on a regional sustainability project to try and again align the regional goals and make sure that we're all working together and not against each other in terms of trying to identify what are some good sustainability pieces. And so we're working right now on benchmarking and strategizing. We have regional community 20-year goals as well as the installation's 20-year goals. Um, and really what it comes down to is community readiness supports soldier and family readiness. Taking care of soldiers and families in the community help soldiers main focus on their job. And I know you can't read this quote, so I'm going to read it for you. We asked the garrison commander, Colonel McLaughlin, to give us a quote based on the economic and the impacts of child care and what child care means for being, having access to quality, affordable child care. And he said that many Fort Car Carson families live off post and benefit from services provided in the community. Access to quality, affordable, early care and education allows our soldiers and spouses to work with peace of mind that their children are receiving needed care particularly when their parents serve in harm's way. We're grateful for the wonderful community we live in that works with us daily to ensure our kids have the care and nurturing they need. And that's really what we're trying to do is make sure the community supports what the families need so that the quality of life for the entire region are, is good and improves and that, again, soldiers can concentrate on their jobs. That's really it. I guess we'll ask questions at the last part, so I'll stop talking. Our third presenter is from San Antonio, and San Antonio has not only one, but four installations that they've been working with in partnership to help support their missions there. <clears throat> in response to BRAC 2005, San Antonio set up both the Military Transformation Task Force and the Office of Military Affairs to deal with growth at Fort Sam Houston, Camp Bullis, Lackland Air Force Base, and Randolph Air Force Base. Um, the $2.2 billion of new construction and a large influx of personnel to Fort Sam Houston led to a growth management plan and a community development office to deal with neighborhoods, transportation, public safety, and other critical issues um, in reaction to and response to the growth. Additionally, joint land use studies to deal with compatibility issues were undertaken for Camp Bullis, Lackland Air Force Base, and Randolph Air Force Base. Um, and here to talk about several of the initiatives underway in San Antonio is Mr. Frank Sherman. Frank is the Deputy Director for the Office of Military Affairs for the City of San Antonio. Um, prior to becoming Deputy Director, which is fairly new, fairly recent, um, Frank was the Project Manager for the Camp Bullis Joint Land Use Project. Um, he's also been the Administrator of the Amana Colonies Land Use District, Village Manager for Bayside, Wisconsin, Safety and Service Director for Reading, Ohio, and Chair of Aerospace Studies um, at Miami University in Ohio, um, Director of Current Operations, Strategic Air Command Headquarters, um, U.S. Air Force and Commander Pilot, excuse me, Command Pilot Colonel Air Force, U.S. Air Force <laughs> retired, and um, Frank's background, educational background, is he has a Master's in Public Administration. So, Mr. Frank Sherman from the Office of Military Affairs, City of San Antonio. Uh, as Joan mentioned, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the City of San Antonio and Barrett County and their response to the 2005 BRAC. <clears throat> a little background here. Uh, a lot of people call San Antonio Military City USA. Uh, there are four active uh, military bases. Uh, <clears throat> Fort Sam Houston, which is kind of an urban base right downtown. 
uh, Camp Bullis up here to the north, uh, Randolph Air Force Base over on the east, and Lackland Air Force Base uh, down to the southwest. <clears throat> and with BRAC 2005, uh, there was a lot of growth, and mainly the growth was going to take place at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, Fort Sam Houston is essentially the home of Army medicine, and now it may be the home of uh, Air Force medicine, uh, Navy medicine, and, and, and all, because armed forces, they will all have their enlisted medics uh, trained there at, uh, at Fort Sam. Uh, so that's a new mission they picked up. Uh, there are approximately 5,500 families coming in, a permanent party, civilian and military, uh, to work on and around uh, Fort Sam. Uh, the population of the students uh, is going to go from 5,000 to about 9,000. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite a bit of growth all at one time. They're going to graduate 47,000 uh, medics a year at Fort Sam. And then when they graduate, oh, I want to hit one thing. Uh, Joan already mentioned it. Uh, the medical education and training campus at uh, Fort Sam uh, a little over $2 billion was spent on infrastructure there, building that campus and other buildings, so uh, quite a construction project. Uh, when they graduate from Fort Sam, they go up the road to Camp Bullis, and Camp Bullis is where they get their medic field training. It's a 28,000-acre, uh, mainly undeveloped property and uh, installation. Uh, not only medic training there, but other things uh, such as the Air Force uh, Security Forces from Lackland train up there. They have a large footprint and uh, a lot going on up at Camp Bullis. And the third one, uh, Randolph Air Force Base over here to the east, uh, that's the uh, home of Air Education and Training Center, uh, the Air Force Personnel Center. Uh, they have two runways. Uh, they do uh, training for flight instructors and uh, pre-fighter fundamentals uh, training and a lot of other things out there. And finally, Lackland, down here to the southwest, Anybody that comes into the Air Force and enlisted status goes through Lackland Air Force Base, the single point of entry. Uh, quite a few folks go through there. And they have other missions and organizations there too. The 24th Air Force, uh, otherwise known as uh, Cyber Command, opened up a headquarters there not too long ago. Uh, and they also, using the Lackland field, uh, there's a C-5 training wing there, a reserve unit, and an F-16 Air National Guard uh, wing. So a lot going on. To put it in summary, the total economic impact, DOD economic impact in the San Antonio area is approximately $13.3 billion, uh, something around 78,000 military and civilian full-time employees, 44,000 DOD contractors, 152,000 students per year go through these bases. So and we have 48,000 retirees too, but it's, it's a large enterprise. That gives you a little background. All these bases now come, to, uh, come under Joint Base San Antonio for, for support. <clears throat> so after uh, BRAC 2005, the city decided to, actually the city, county, and the chamber decided to form a military transformation task force. And the city, county, and chamber are tri-chairs of this. And what they did was immediately uh, set up some MTF, MTTF committees, uh, transportation and growth, legislation and public affairs, and so on. What the city did, did then in 2008 was opened and created the Office of Military Affairs under the city manager's office. And we are the support and the action agency for the MTTF, besides taking action initiatives on our own. Uh, and what came out of one of the issues, the growth management plan that we did, was a community development office, which in turn did some action plans a mobility and transportation action plan and a community revitalization action plan. So we'll talk a little bit about those things. Okay, what was initiated, what we're going to talk about today, a little bit uh, about the growth management plan. Again, Fort Sam Houston was the big issue. Uh, it's in an urban area, um, low income area, and the city wanted to leverage uh, the growth there and what was going on. Uh, they wanted to increase the quality of life in the area, jobs, et cetera. So a lot was done around Fort Sam Houston. Uh, the joint land use studies, as was mentioned, uh, compatibility issues, and the main one was, uh, the critical one was Camp Bullis because of all the extra folks they were going to get and some issues they had with endangered species, et cetera, and uh, then Lackland and Randolph. And finally, the community military partnerships, those are things that we want to do after BRAC is over uh, in our continued uh, relations with the military. <coughs> 
So one of the plans that the Community Development Office uh, established and worked on and took action on was community, uh, neighborhood revitalization. They wanted to do some infill of vacant lots. Remember, this was a low-income area. Uh, they wanted to do various good neighbor initiatives, exterior property maintenance code, uh, cleanup of properties, sidewalk construction, uh, help growth of business and commercial areas, and so on. And this is just one of the initiatives they did. They went out and did some exterior uh, rehab and painting of homes. Uh, a lot of work done on that, averaged about $5,000 per home. They did a lot of code enforcement. They did a code enforcement sweep uh, to identify exterior property maintenance issues. <clears throat> and I won't read the laundry list of uh, the progress report here, but on the first two, uh, there was a decrease in crime. And the other half dozen things that they reported on, uh, there was an increase in structures uh, demolished, uh, uh, graffiti abated, and so on. Dogs rounded up. Uh, what the growth management plan did around the Fort Sam Houston area, it actually spotlighted for the city uh, issues that needed to be taken care of. And through the community development office, they did a, a heck of a job on it. Then there was a mobility and transportation plan uh, with, uh, well, they wanted to improve, frankly, the entrances to Fort Sam Houston and relieve some of the traffic congestion. Uh, there are two lane roads leading in at least to the south entrance and uh, things needed to be changed. Uh, they wanted to make the aesthetic improvements and they wanted to provide uh, a signature gateway uh, to the fort. Uh, we were able also to get a uh, three point or one point three million dollar uh, EDA grant uh, to do some water main improvement to help the commercial businesses uh, just outside the base. And again, I mentioned sidewalk improvements. But the big number here it shows all in all a community commitment was seventy six million dollars uh, to help out around the Fort Sam area, and most of that was from a bond program two thousand seven. Uh, 2012 bond program at the city head. This is just an example of a combined effort. Walter Street is the approach to Fort Sam from the south. Uh, Fort Sam Houston was building a, a new modern high security access control point and uh, the city of San Antonio decided to widen and improve uh, Walter Street and TxDOT uh, improved uh, the frontage road and uh, replaced a uh, bridge across uh, I-35. So uh, again, a very successful project. Walter Street still ongoing. And here is what we uh, have an artist conception of. Uh, the work is taking place now on Walter Street, a complete street type project where it handles not only vehicles, uh, pedestrians, uh, bike traffic, uh, well landscaped and uh, aesthetically pleasing. Okay, change subjects to compatible use. Uh, we also have uh, three joint land use studies, one complete, one underway, and one going to happen in the future. The Camp Bullis joint land use study, uh, as Joan mentioned, I was the project manager for that. It took about one year. Well, it took about 30 years off of my life. I'm only really 35 <laughs> years old. Uh, we have some people out there in the audience that uh, were there at the time that can vouch for it. Uh, so anyway, Camp Bullis was complete in June 2009, and we've done a lot on implementation. We'll get into that. Lackland Air Force Base hopefully be complete uh, in August next month, and Randolph will be starting up this winter. Okay, here's an example. Camp Bullis, intense development right outside the fence line. What was happening was uh, the area is prime for developers. It's a prime area. Um, developers would come in and essentially scrape uh, the landscape, and a lot was going on in the way of building subdivisions. And as you can see down in the lower left-hand corner, housing was built right up against the fence line of Camp Bullis. So we had a lot of issues, and the main issue here was when the developers did this, uh, the Army and the environmentalists alleged that the developers were scraping away habitat for an endangered species, the golden cheek warbler mainly. And what would happen, the birds go south uh, for the winter, South America, Latin America, and then fly back. When they fly back in March, they come back and their habitat's gone. Where do they go? Hey, Bullis is 28,000 acres of 
you know, undeveloped area, a lot of habitat, and they fly onto camp bullets. A lot of them do. That means camp bullets can't use that area for training. But they're going to need more area for training because they have more students. So it was a critical issue. So we did the joint land use study. <clears throat> the area of concern was out about five miles. And we actually came up with uh, five major areas or issues we need to address. Communication, light pollution, noise, endangered species, and land use compatibility. Now just briefly on communication, the military and the base did really not, they didn't communicate uh, with the city. The city and the military uh, didn't have any formal means of communication. Uh, Camp Bullis and Fort Sam didn't know what was happening outside their boundary until it actually happened. Uh, that was taken care of, and I'll explain that in a little while. Uh, light pollution, uh, there was night vision goggle training for both aviation and ground training of troops. Uh, light pollution was a real issue. Uh, noise, uh, two aspects uh, around the base uh, for quality of life. Uh, people would like to have less noise naturally and the base would like to have less complaints. Uh, endangered species, as I already mentioned, and land, land use compatibility. And the issue here is on land use compatibility, the city limits only go to right about here. In other words, the lower third of Camp Bullis. So Camp Bullis was about two thirds in the county and in the city extraterritorial jurisdiction, ETJ, no land use control, no zoning. So how do you handle uh, things that crop up outside where you don't have control? That was a real challenge. First thing we had to do was a communications notification memorandum of understanding. Uh, we set up a protocol uh, for anything, any development within five miles of Camp Willis and over uh, 10 acres, the military was notified immediately and the protocol called for them to respond within three days back to the city. The city then would take the response, let the developer know if there were any issues, and a lot of times what it came down to was the military and the developer got together, the military explained what their issues were, and a lot of times problems got resolved. And that's been working extremely well. Dark sky, light pollution, uh, all of the communities around uh, Camp Bullis uh, they all passed a dark sky ordinance or order in the case of counties, which required for any new construction, actually any new lighting that went up, downward lighting, fully shielded, lights off, to, uh, lights off after 11 p.m. for businesses that were closed, uh, limited uh, the intensity of light, and also limited light uh, and location of billboards, et cetera. So that pretty much took care of the dark sky issue. Everything else was grandfathered. It was only uh, new replaced lights or new construction. Uh, the noise issue. Uh, there was a sound attenuation ordinance done by the city. Uh, it required that inside of a, a structure you had to decrease, when you built it, you had to decrease the uh, number of decibels by 25. Uh, and that was, again, only for new construction. And it was for residences. And it was for noise sensitive uses for libraries, uh, hospitals, uh, nursing homes, et cetera. And I thought I'd toss in a picture of the, the beautiful little golden cheek warbler, the black cat vario, and the ugly cave bugs. Uh, <laughs> a lot of caves and karst on the uh, uh, southern part of Camp Bullis in the area, and those are all endangered species. That was a big issue. How do you handle endangered species? And the military thought the city could do something the city, however, cannot enforce federal law, so there's only a certain amount they can do. But in the development process, when a developer came in, if they wanted to build within the presumptive endangered species habitat area within five miles of Camp Bullis, they were required to state whether or not they've done an endangered species survey and whether or not they have sent it to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And if they had, who was a biologist and what was their license number, et cetera. Again, I mentioned uh, we cannot enforce uh, a federal law and we do not hold up or delay the permits of individuals. Uh, it's just information that we provide to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The big question was, how can Camp Bullis clear or thin more habitat to acquire land 
for more training area. But one of the solutions was the city owned about 3,000 acres of golden cheek warbler habitat. And what they did was they put it under a permanent conservation easement, essentially transferred the land to the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And with that, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, gave the city 1,100 acres of mitigation credit, which the city then transferred to Camp Bullis so they could clear 1,100 acres uh, on the installation. And they've done so, and it's provided a lot of training area. The second uh, issue we're working on now is uh, another nature area in the city that has golden cheek warblers, Scenic Canyon, uh, possibly getting 223 more acres of credit for Camp Bullis. And as we speak, right now in the city of San Antonio, the Conservation Advisory Board is meeting at City Hall uh, to determine whether or not to approve it and send it to City Council. It already went through the Parks and Recreation Board as approved. So hopefully we'll get another 223 acres for Camp Bullis. And finally, the last major item on the JLUS was a land use plan. And it was called the North Sector Land Use Plan when it was done. It incorporated all of the joint land use study recommendations. For instance, uh, up on the north end of Camp Bullis, right up there in the northeast corner, there's a combat assault landing strip. Uh, you wouldn't want to have a landfill being built up there right off uh, outside the fence line. Uh, it attracts birds, and the birds and aircraft in the same air, airspace don't work. So all those recommendations from the JLS were incorporated into the uh, North Sector Land Use Plan. And I learned yesterday uh, by email that that particular plan is submitted, going to be submitted to the Texas chapter of the American Planning Association uh, for an award, and it was very well done. Okay, now looking to the future, what we would like to do, we would like to conduct uh, a shared services uh, study uh, to see if we can help out the military bases by reducing their installation support costs. Uh, it would naturally uh, help them reduce their cost and would help the city uh, by increasing ties to the military and also uh, in the form of revenue back to the city, uh, trying to take advantage of uh, economies of scale and things like that. So the military, community military partnership study, these are the areas we're going to look at. Uh, won't go to them in detail, but uh, transportation, repair and maintenance of roads and traffic signals, utilities and drainage, stormwater, electricity, uh, water, etc. cetera. Uh, even cultural heritage, Fort Sam has a museum, a lot of historic sites. Uh, family services, uh, child care, and things like that. So we hope to get a study going to check that out to see where we can uh, to join with the city and shared services. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, if you have any questions as far as details, uh, my number is up there and uh, my email and a website. And we'll entertain questions after Joan here uh, gives a summary. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And um, I did look around the, the audience a little bit as the, the panelists were speaking. And despite being right after lunch, I saw most <laughs> eyes open. And so you must have been hearing something that piqued your interest um, um, and you found interesting and wanted to maybe learn more about. So we'd like to open it up for questions. Um, if you have any questions, please come to the microphone so everyone will be able to hear the question and direct which of the panelists your question's going to. We don't have any, oh great. <laughs> Mr. Sherman, can you talk a little bit about um, some of your challenges of getting um, the recommendations from your JLO studies implemented into, codified into code or regulations and, and, and some of those battles between other interests in the city? Uh, it was very, it's an interesting question. Uh, what we did, we did form uh, an implementation committee. The implementation committee consisted of only government entities that participated in the JLUS. In other words, three counties and two cities. The stakeholders, uh, developers, professional real estate people, and others, uh, the way we looked at it, had their say uh, in the study and, and voted uh, when it was approved, members of the executive committee. So 
one of the things that uh, was important also was the fact was the issue was so critical to Camp Bullis, uh, the commanding general called it a tipping point. And, you know, whether or not Camp Bullis was going to be able to remain open. And it got a lot of press. And when it got a lot of press, um, a lot of folks, elected officials, and everybody else had a lot of motivation to implement. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of objection to the implementation of the various ordinances or orders. Uh, we did bring in, though, the city brought in the developers when we when they did the sound attenuation ordinance or when we did the light ordinance. We brought the folks in. We sat down at the table with them. Uh, we got their objections and their recommendations and their help, and it, and it was a help in, in, in doing the ordinances. The implementation was actually easier than the JLIS process to get the JLIS study done, if you can believe that. So and right now, we have completed 73% of the recommendations and 100% of all the high priority, uh, we've addressed 100% of all the high priority military uh, issues that they had. So hope that helps. I noticed that uh, the San Antonio region done the North Sector land use plan and then uh, but my question is really geared towards uh, future growth and if you're working in your plans to anticipate any additional uh, growth at the bases and how you're trying to accommodate that so that when the situation presents itself again, you've got something to work with. Right. And I'll, I'll give credit. Uh, our planning department hired a consultant uh, to do the North Sector Land Use Plan. and. As you could imagine, the joint land use study had a lot of detailed recommendations in it of what should or shouldn't go in around a military installation. Uh, we didn't have an ACUS because there's not an official runway up there. It's a combat assault landing strip. So we didn't have that to go by. But those recommendations were almost verbatim uh, put into the North Sector Land Use Plan. And the problem is a plan's a plan. And when you have no zoning control or no land use control, uh, all you can say is when they come before the Planning Commission or Zoning Commission, uh, if they have to, you can say the plan recommends such and such, but you don't have actual control. So the property rights was a big issue in this, in this JLS. Farmers and ranchers on the north end didn't want to have anything to do with regulation of their land. Uh, and it's understandable. Property issues are a, a big issue, especially in Texas. So. But anyway, it was a it was a well done plan. Thanks, Ms. Hatton. A question on your statistics and numbers. Um, the 2010 census was the first one in a long time that didn't ask all that qualitative data. You just got the the base number of who you are and what you lived in, where you live. Uh, some of the bases are not in metropolitan statistical areas, so they don't get the American Community Survey information. A lot of bases aren't located right next to the the state university. Um, how would would you be able to give some advice for how bases can get that type of data if they're in rural areas or they don't have the resources that you have? What we were able to do, and I would suggest if you could do it, is get access to Defense Manpower Data Center data. And that's the DEERS data that gives detailed information where folks are living. We were able to get information as detailed as soldier and family location by zip code and street name. It's not personally identifiable. I can't, I can't tell you exactly where Sergeant Smith is living, but I can tell you that there are 15 sergeants living in this zip code, so that we got it broken down by unit, by rank, and again, by age, how many one-year-olds, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, and that is the most detailed data. Now, they're always, with every, and we used it again, I heard the word triangulate at the lunch speakers. We triangulated with a lot of information. We also took survey information. If you can, soldiers and families are tired of, answering survey questions, but if you can get some information or tie on to uh, an MWR survey or a housing survey to get more detailed information um, that can help partner with the other deer's information, that's what I would aim for. Actually, Carl, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but since you're also in more of a rural area and that you did work with your installation and in doing a survey to get some demographic information, is there anything that you might want to share that might be helpful? to him as far as how you were able to get support from the installation and the types of data that you were able to get as a rural area. 
We might need you to come up to the mic, though. JBLM, I think I heard you mention in your presentation that you use some density controls, and I'm paraphrasing now, but you say you, if, if they didn't meet the density controls, you invited them to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. that Can you elaborate on the density controls you use and the success you had with them? When a person comes into the uh, uh, city and wishes to do development, uh, they go to the second floor city uh, community development department. At that point, they're asked uh, a variety of questions. Do you check on your zoning? Check to see if uh, you need a building permit to do any tenant improvements. Obtain a business license, and through that process, we find we determine whether or not it's built into the code, the zoning code for Lakewood, whether or not they uh, have a density problem with their type of use. Now, if they have a, a density problem and there are too many employees per acre on site, then we have some issues with our code and then also with, the, the, with McCord Air Force Base. Because in the past, they've been very clear about their desire uh, not to have c uh, compatibility or conflict problems at the end of the runway, particularly because the, much of the clear zone property is still developed and held in private hands. So uh, because of those things, we, we take a look at density uh, on, on commercial industrial businesses. We've run into, since we've been a city since 1996, we've run into that problem about two or three times. It hasn't been a, a big problem, but nevertheless, on occasion, we get into this kind of issue. And in some cases, we've had to tell property owners or developers that they need to find another location. Um, there's industrial parks located in Lakewood. They can go to those locations. We may also work with the Pierce County Economic Development Office in helping them find another location elsewhere. But um, it, it, it does tend to be a problem on occasion. Uh, the last time that we had a problem was when an individual wanted to have um, a large outdoor sales area where about two or 300 people were showing up at a time uh, in the clear zone on an auction house. Uh, that was definitely not going to be permitted because of its proximity to the end of the runway. But in those kinds of situations, we do take a careful look to make sure that we're not violating our own code. And that is unique in Lakewood because we have so many non-conforming uses at the end of the runway. Okay, um, I actually have a question for, for all three of you, and that is that Maybe it's easier for a community to rally and respond to a particular action, such as a base closure, or in your case, um, mission growth, where the community needs to work together to know how to resolve uh, a certain issue that they're presented with. Um, now that you've been doing this for several years, um, and there is some men momentum and some dialogue that's been established with the installation, do you see this continuing beyond the responding to the immediate growth action? Um, and uh, the, the benefit and this ongoing community installation relationship. And, and how do you see yourselves moving on from, from this point? We found uh, through the uh, joint land use study process that there, prior, at the beginning of it, there was a lot of distrust between the developers and the city, between the city and the military, the military and the city. Uh, a lot of distrust had to be overcome to complete the, uh, the joint land use study for Camp Bullis. We found out in that year process, 
after the first, it took about almost the first three months. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this, but it took almost three months before the level of trust got to the point where you could actually get something done. And we have found the biggest benefit for the joint land use, from the joint land use study is the fact uh, that people are communicating and talking. They know what one another's issues are. Uh, and, and, and people generally try to help. And this will continue. We have a Camp Bullis Preservation Partnership Group that meets occasionally to talk about what's going on at Camp Bullis. And I'm sure the same thing will happen uh, with Lackland and Randolph. And the, the MTTF Military Transformation Task Force will be an ongoing uh, body where uh, the communication will continue. I expect we'll continue in the Fort Carson region as well, too, um, for a lot of reasons. I think both sides of the fence, if you will, now realize that having that information, sharing that coordination is helpful to both sides. Fort Carson is continuing to rely on the community for help with services, making sure that their families are taken care of, as we talked about, and being able to share information. That, that sort of infrastructure, if you will, is now in place and will continue. And not only that, as I mentioned, there are a couple other military installations in our region. And as we share the information that we've got, for example, the child care analysis, Peterson and Schriever uh, have looked at us and said, well, can you do that for us as well, too? So the benefits are kind of, I think, beyond just Fort Carson growth and what we can do as, as a really organized regional planning and information sharing. Well, the two people to my left are further along than we are. So I, I will let me state this by going back to the very beginning when we started the growth management plan process. We actually went to the state of Washington and said, is this something that you want to do? They, they were not inclined to do it. Then we went to Pierce County and said, uh, is this something that you would want to do? And if you don't want to do it, do you mind if we take it on? They said, sure. Uh, then we also went to the city of Tacoma because it's a very large community within our area and asked the, 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 that city their preference and they said, we're not inclined to support it this time, but if Lakewood wants to do it, you can go ahead. And, and so while we went through that process, we made sure that all these other entities were involved. But I will say to you, before the, before the process began, there were strained relations between local government and, and, and Joint Base lewis McCord. As a result of doing the growth management plan, there's been greater trust, and now we're being able to uh, use one another to help solve problems. Ultimately, we would like to, to be where San Antonio is heading, where we are providing them municip municipal services and reducing some of their costs, at the same time seeing cost efficiencies on our side. Uh, those are some of our goals, and we're not quite there yet, but that's something that we're looking forward to. Okay. Thank you. Um, one last call for any more questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you believe was the basis of that mistrust in the beginning? Was it ignorance or was there past maltreatments? Do you have any assessment? I guess to you. <laughs> Honest answer, it was because the city of Lakewood had just incorporated and many people thought it was too big for its britches because Lakewood decided to annex the bases. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that created a great deal of conflict at the local level but also with, with, with the military personnel. And since then, those, that is no longer an issue with the city of Lakewood. Uh, annexation is not our purpose here. Annexation is, is not even on the table at the moment. What, what is on the table is seeing we can solve, realistically, a lot of our transportation problems. Thank you. Could I, could I answer a little bit on that one? Uh, would state, state your question again for me. I, I want to make sure I hit the right thing. In your impression, in your understanding, what was the basis for that mistrust? Where did that come from? Okay. I think in our case, it came from a joint land use study was done in 1995 and it sat on the shelf and nobody did anything. So the military didn't have any confidence maybe in the city uh, to take care of the issues. There was some uh, suspicion that maybe the developers and real estate people had a hand in, in keeping it shelved and nothing happened. So it was prior experience that uh, I think that they were going on to tell you the truth and it was difficult to overcome I'm very honest with you so 
I know that wasn't aimed directly here, but in, in terms that was more in the land use issue and the trust issue. But I think there's also a sense in military that military wants to take care of their own. And we're where they're talking about families or behavioral health services or everything else, we're going to take care of it ourselves. But I think as we've worked through some of these issues, they realize that the community is an integral part of the installation and vice versa. And through continuing to work together, it shows that there's mutual benefit. Okay, again, thank you to all of you for attending today's session and please welcome me and thank you in our panel. So from wherever to Wisconsin to Texas and yes. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, in a city management background as well too? Yeah, fairly sorry, the city management.